Well, maybe we should dive into this case study unless you had something else. I'll share my screen. This is a current client of mine. I saw him earlier this week. I've seen him only twice so far. Um, I just thought it was a really interesting case because um, th because of what he came in. I didn't write that much down, but um, definitely we can talk about it too. So I'll just read through what I have here so far uh, that he um, presents as a patient client who is seven, about 74 years old, comes in. His main purpose for coming in is that he feels he's getting weaker in his leg. Uh, he doesn't like that feeling and is starting to feel really limited in his walking. He says he can only walk for 10 minutes before he feels too weak to continue. His main goal is to get stronger so that he can walk with his wife about 30 minutes or so a day is what she does and that's what he would like to be able to do. When you meet him uh, and you look at his posture, you don't, he doesn't stand out as one of those like um, totally tucked head forward, hunched over type of people, no extreme postural issues, but he does stand with a posterior pelvic tilt. His spinal curves are really very flat and he has a mild forward head position and he's really standing on his heels. So if you can imagine what that might look like, it's kind of that tucked butt, um, slightly forward head. I can back up and show you, right? So kind of tucked, tucked butt, slightly forward head, a little bit concave in the chest um, and really reducing the spinal curves. So not a lot of curving, really kind of straightened curves a little bit straightened forward neck position. You watch him walk and this was sort of the, the highlight as I watched him walk and he had very little sagittal motion. So very little anterior posterior and his walk was, was very side to side lateral. Um, in fact, extremely so more, you know, looking at that posture, you wouldn't think, but his gait is very like this sideways. Um, doesn't have any hip issues that have been spoken about, nothing else that would indicate why he was walking with this sideways motion. So not, not a lot of information I know, but so what other information do you think or would you like to get about this person, really? Um, I'm curious as to, was he walking longer before? Like, was it, is this something new that's just come up? Did he, did he walk with his wife yeah. six months mm -hmm. ago and suddenly uh, over the course of a few months, he's just getting weaker and weaker? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I actually asked him the same question. Uh, he said that during COVID, he got really lazy. Um, he didn't do much during COVID. And so he kind of stopped exercising. And now he's trying to exercise again the last several months and he just can't get mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. So, and he feels he got a lot weaker during the two years of COVID. He thinks that's a big part of it. So he's really just coming in because he feels weak mm -hmm. to me. And then yet, that's what he says. And then he came in yesterday, or yesterday, a couple of days ago, two days ago. And he said that he does also work out with a trainer three days a week now. So he's working with a trainer three days a week. He's doing Pilates two days a week. So he's a busy guy right now. Um, he's So he says he thinks it's really gonna help him. And um, yeah, trying not to give away everything <laughs> <laughs> all at once. And I'm trying to stop myself so that I can let us have a discussion about it. <laughs> not just, be, uh, yeah, so um, what else? Yeah, what else is missing that you might wanna know? Um, let's see. I'm trying to think with the side to side gate. Is something hurting <laughs> or does he just walk that way? Like, does his low back hurt? Does his, do his hips hurt? Do yeah. his knees hurt? Is there some reason that he's going side to side? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you ask him, he says he, when I said, do you notice if I didn't, it didn't come up that way, but let's just say, if you asked him, did you, do you notice if he says, yeah, I've really noticed, I'm really highly aware that my gait pattern has become very side to side and not very, like it's changed. He doesn't have any idea why. Huh. So that's sort of the detective work. And that's kind of why I thought this was so interesting 
is because how do you not know why you walk us the way you walk? I mean, you don't, if it happens gradually over time, or maybe in his case, because he had a break in much movement at all um, and really became very sedentary. And then he got back and, and all of a sudden it's just not working the way it was before is what it feels like. And he's sort of invented a new way to move for himself. Hmm. So if you think of somebody who has a side lateral swaying gait versus the anterior posterior sagittal gait, what um, what things come to mind for you? Um, I always think it's like <laughs> something in the midline isn't feeling right and you're trying to kind of avoid it and get almost up and around something that's not working towards the midline. I, know. Yeah, I always okay. think when you've been on a horse and you're kind of like, whoo, and you're trying to kind of waddle around because your thighs are sore or your, like your sits bones are hurting or something, I don't know, something towards okay. the midline. So pain somewhere in the midline. Okay, and so the wider leg stance is, is giving him space there? Yeah, maybe. Or something. Okay. Or he can't. He can't hold himself on one leg. Maybe he's got that okay. glute knee weakness where he can't, he can't get the gait properly to, to swing the leg through. So he just kind of waddles it sideways. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can't hold on one leg. Can't, you said something, a swing leg through. Why would he not be able to swing a leg through? Because he's weak on his outside glute, the glute knee or something. Weak on glute knee. Okay, I think that's one really plausible cause. What would be the other reason why you wouldn't be able to maintain that sagittal position? You can't get your leg oh, could... up and through. Okay, either you can't get your leg up and through. Okay, so let's let's hold for a second. If, if we're weak on glute medius, mm -hmm. right? What is that pattern? That pattern is going to look like I oh, take right. a step and my hip drops, right. right? So then I take a step. If it's both sides, this other hip's going to kind of drop out. So I'm going to get a swagger okay. side to side gait, okay? Or, or one side or both sides. His gait pattern isn't quite that. I mean, I think you're getting super close. His gait pattern is not quite that. His gait pattern is actually this. So you said something else. Um, maybe he can't hold on one leg. What do you do if you feel like you can't hold yourself up on one leg? What happens? Balance. What are we balance? <laughs> uh huh. So that is a big for elder population. Now seventy four is not that old. Hmm. Uh, for some, it is old. For others, right? And he if would be on that his gait pattern looks like an older person's pattern than what he actually appears to be. So I think that's probably why he's also frustrated with it. Mm -hmm. But if you can't balance, what are you going to do? If, if you think about yourself, if you are afraid you're going to fall, what do you do? Legs wider. Legs wide. And you take a big wide stand, standing position. So if somebody's afraid of losing balance, their, their position gets wider. So perhaps balance is an issue. And, and that would be something that I would really take a close look at, I think, um, with him is kind of take a look and test balance and see how good that balance is. And we can talk about what happened when we tested balance to see. Okay, so why? what's another reason? I think all these are valid. Weak glute medius. If you're weak glute medius on one side, you cannot swing the other leg through. There's no space for it. That's absolutely right. Um, if you can't get your leg up and through, that could be um, because of weakness where, if you can't get your leg up and through. And what would that look like? Um, so it could be, well, there's always our friend the psoas to get that leg up. Yeah. But I'm thinking um, also like the QL to kind of get the hip to come up and around. Okay, so we could have so as issue, we could have weak QL. 
Um, so, but do we really need to hit pike very much to get a leg through? If if glute medius on the opposite side is working, do we need much QL? No, maybe not. Mm, yeah, maybe not. Uh, it's a, it's a potential it's a potential problem for sure, but maybe not directly affecting gait. Um, and psoas, right? If psoas, what is something else you need to be able to do to clear your foot and gait? Thinking a little bit lower down. Oh, plantar flex. You need to be able to plantar flex the foot and dorsiflex the foot, right? So ankle. PF and DF, and a little bit higher than that, what do we need to be able to do at our knee? Flex it. Flex it, yeah. And, and it's interesting because the knee flexion has to get to 60 degrees, mm. right? You have to have at least 60 degrees of knee flexion for you to clear that leg. So we also need knee flexion to 60 degrees. So if any of those things aren't happening, we're going to start seeing maybe more side-to-side -side gait. Um, any of these things are going to definitely change gait pattern. And there's still one other thing that would prevent me from having that sagittal gait tightness somewhere. Um. So we've mentioned psoas here as an issue because if psoas is really tight, it's gonna, or too, too much work, you're gonna look like you're marching, mm -hmm. right? If you have too much psoas, um, and if psoas is tight, what happens? What do you lose? You lose your... <laughs> I'll, give you a, I'll give you a hint. Is that when you lose your lumbar curve? No. Well, you lose you... your... Hip. If you can't get your thigh to pass behind you, you're losing your hip extension, right? Yeah. So if so as it's too tight, you're not gonna get sagittal motion in your gait pattern, right? And that's a big one. So you won't get, if you don't have hip extension, um, you're gonna have more sagittal gait or you're gonna have, so hip extension can be either lateral, I should say lateral gait, less sagittal gait or increased lumbar, extension with gait, right? So you you have to, in order to have a regular gait pattern, that leg has to get behind you. If you don't have enough hip, expense, hip extension and you still wanna keep a sagittal gait, you have to go to lumbar extension. Now, uh, let's think about his whole picture. He's, he's coming and saying his legs are weak. And after not exercising during COVID, um, I ha any healthy person can feel that their legs are weak, get trying to get back to walking. But, but do you think, would you think in general that somebody who takes a break from walking gets, becomes kind of couch potato, that, he, that they would not be able to go more than 10 minutes because their legs feel that weak? No, that, that seems kind of extreme. Weak. It seems kind of extreme, right? And we talked about this actually last week a little bit about what things could give you the sensation of weakness in the legs that may not actually be muscular weakness in the leg. Mm -hmm. Do you remember some of that mm -hmm. discussion? Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at this lateral gait pattern. I'm thinking about this side, side to side. There's, I'm guessing that the hip flexors are tight. And that's a really common pattern in a 74 year old man. It's a really common pattern in 74 year old women too, but even more so in men because they tend to be tighter, I think. In general, that was, that's why I think I see it, but I see it a lot. And I see the posterior pelvis usually means the psoas is tight already. So we've got a lot of giveaways as to psoas being tight. The question is why is psoas so tight? Is it because he sat like a couch potato for a long time? Or is there another reason why they got tight and why he has himself in that posterior pelvic tilt? Mm. So what anything come to mind if we think about why does somebody adopt the posture of a flat spine posterior tilt if that wasn't their posture before? 
Yeah. Definitely. I think the sitting, I mean, even just from my experience, like our couch, you know, has that curve and it, mm -hmm. it just pushes me into that step all the time. Um, mm -hmm. So there's that, but then, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I keep going back to something is hurting or something isn't feeling quite right. Right. Okay. And I love that that's what you're thinking, because I think something's bothering him that he doesn't even know about. Mm. Right. So sitting we can cause um can cause tightness. Right. I'm oh, sorry, not spelling very well. Let's focus on my typing. <laughs> um so sitting can cause the tightness. Um yes, at hip flexors, it can cause flattening back. So hip flexors um tight um slash posterior back with your pelvis okay so what happens if we go into a posterior pelvic tilt i'm going to grab my skeleton here if we take the skeleton right and we look and think about it right now um if i look at the structure normally i should have this lordotic curve and normally that puts me in a very good alignment for all the nerves and discs and everything else coming out if I adopt a posture of posterior pelvic tilt, what essentially is going to happen to my lumbar spine? So I'm going to see if I can get Francesca, my friend here, to posterior pelvic tilt without breaking her ribs, <laughs> but she doesn't really want to do it. But the idea is if I go into a posterior pelvic tilt, there we go. What happens to the spaces between those vertebra? Well, they open in the back, but they close open in the, front. in the back, Yeah, but close in the front. But what comes out the back of the spine? Your nerves. Yeah. My nerves, all my nerves. Yes. So if I take this and I'm opening it up, maybe I'm trying to avoid some nerve compression. Mm. Right. And also, if I have adopted this sideways gait, I don't like extension. If I'm tight in the psoas and now I'm posterior tilting, which is making me even tighter, and now I'm walking sideways gait. Um, if I have those tight hips, I'm by default, in order to walk in a sagittal plane, I need to extend somewhere. It's not going to come from my hip flexors if they're too tight. It's going to come from my lumbar spine. If I get extension in my lumbar spine and I have a lot of compression back here, I'm going to compress the nerves more. And one of the major symptoms with nerve compression is fatigue, heavy legs. Huh. Okay. So people with Spinal stenosis are this kind of group of people most common. They prefer to sit than stand or walk because standing and walking, any extension in the lumbar spine puts compression on the nerves because what's, what could be happening is that the foramen where the nerves are exiting uh, are getting, uh, have gotten overgrown, bone overgrowth, like an arthritic change or something. Um, that could be making the openings for the nerves smaller. Or it can also, stenosis can also happen in the central canal of the spine. So that could, it could be happening within where the nerves are in there, right? In the spinal canal, we have that hole in the middle of the vertebra, right? That the spinal cord runs through. Mm -hmm. You can also get stenosis in that bony structure there. And mm -hmm. that makes the canal smaller. Okay. So that also, can put pressure on the nerve and that would be sort of a bilateral pressure um, and usually equally bilateral. And I would say somewhere in the lumbar spine because he's complaining of legs. If it's in the cervical spine, there may be symptoms in arms and legs, right? If that was the case. So I look at this and I think there's a reason, like you said, you said there's a reason why he's walking that way um, something's bothering him. My guess is that there's something going on at his spine. Mm. And there's some nerve compression, right? And because we're not going to really diagnose it, we can look at where his body is and the position that he's as assumed, which is getting himself out of extension as much as possible and creating as much space in the lumbar spine. And we can go with that. And so if, if you consider all of that, what is one thing, like if we want to have, so our concerns would be what you said, that there's some pain or something going on. Oops. 
Um, right, she lost a leg. Uh oh. <laughs> I have to put it back on. I have a little surgery after class. Um, so there's a pain. Our concern is that there's a pain or a reason why um, walking changed. Right? Uh, oh, wow. I really can't type. <laughs> why has the walking pattern changed? Okay, so that's our main concern. If we look at his posture then, and you see what he's adopted as a posture, what, what might you think is a contraindication for him? What wouldn't you want to do with him? Um, the, any flexed things. Okay, any flexed, if I'm worried about discs, right? Any loaded flexion. Um, but he likes sitting, not standing. Um, he tells you he likes sitting. Okay but he doesn't like standing. So what's a component of standing? So no extension. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna extend that spine. Mm -hmm. No. And it's, it's a good idea not to load inflection as well. So um, just a, a side on stenosis, just for information. Um, stenosis, if somebody has spinal stenosis, it is not a diagnosis in and of itself. There's usually a reason why there's stenosis. And often the reason is that there was a disc issue at some point along the way that created a potential pressure on the nerve or stenosis on the nerve. So usually there's a something else going on that caused the stenosis. So I tend to not do any loaded flexion with people who have stenosis also, because I don't know always what the cause of that is. So if somebody were to come in with a diagnosis that says spinal stenosis, I'm not loaded flexion, but I'm also definitely not extending them. And the thing is, is the symptoms will come on almost immediately when you extend the spine. So what are some positions where the spine might extend? And somebody who's not strong, um, so we wanna watch out for what? Oops. Um. Well, I think if you're in supine, it can extend you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, supine with your legs all the way out, right? Yeah. Yes, he's not comfortable in that position. Yeah. He gets symptoms pretty much right away if, if we let him lay down and stretch his legs out. So doesn't like supine straight out. Okay, what's another position that we have to watch out for that might put him in extension? Um. What else would you lean back? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if, if you weren't watching what you're doing with, you know, feet and straps or any of that, if you came too low, that could right. pull them into right. attention. Right. I mean, even, so, I guess, prone with the legs coming down, if he goes from mm -hmm. tabletop to down, it can pull him up. Right. So if we go um, anything, at, anytime he can't stabilize the spine, basically, um, he's going to end up in a extension so um not enough or not able to hold not able to hold spine still with legs lowering would be one um, and i wrote down prone prone laying flat on your belly you're in a bit of extension usually so you it usually i put a pillow under the belly or put them on the arc or a barrel mm -hmm. to keep them out of extension, especially if I want to use glute, use the glutes to do any glute work. So that's another um, thing to, I wouldn't do prone flat without anything under the belly, but I would do it with something under the belly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's great. Um, all right. So let's think about then we have this scenario, we don't have a diagnosis about what's going on. We know that he's uncomfortable while he's walking and potentially standing. We know that he's changed his gait pattern and that he's realizing that his gait pattern's changed, but he doesn't know why. Um, his goal is to get walking. So how are we gonna facilitate that? What, can I ask what you found with the balance? Did you, when you- Oh yeah, balance is poor. Yeah. yeah. So single leg stance, he has a really hard time picking himself up over one leg. 
versus over the other leg. So I don't know if that's a result of the walking pattern now, or if that's um, so that he now is adopted that walking pattern because he was off balance, or if he, because he's been walking that way, he no longer can find his midline and get balanced. Yeah. I don't know, but he couldn't balance um, with one leg up very well. Right? He just couldn't get this hip under. He was very kind of awkward and off. So, but it didn't hurt him more. So I don't think there's any hip or knee issue. I think there's weakness. And I think there's this lack of center so that would definitely be something to work on would be balance. So, okay, let's put down uh, balance exercises, right? Mm -hmm. We want um, balance exercises would be great. What else could we offer him um, that would be helpful for him? I mean, general leg strengthening, you know, mm -hmm. all the, all the various things for that. Um, and then glute strengthening, if we can get him in a, a position to get, like you said before, just even up to neutral with the from yeah from flexion to negative neutral. to neutral yeah. yeah from flexion to neutral in a position that does not put it back in extension so negative to neutral sounds a lot like my little lady we were talking about I know it's not that different right yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then um, what else? Um, what else could you do? If, if you were trying to restore a gait pattern, what are some things that would maybe help that? Uh, well, I mean, footwork, but... Um, yeah, which is strengthening, leg strengthening. Yeah. So, um, but what is there about gait that we... Um, that we there's, have to be able to do. There's the, oh, the arms, yeah. The arms and what happens, it's it's a very diagonal sagittal motion, right? So we need to do, we need to try and replicate those motions. If we want him to have those motions walking, he needs to find those motions again, right? Oh, well, then we use the, the trap table and do all sorts of fun things with That's springs. Exactly. <laughs> that is exactly what we did. Was, um, trap table. We string them up. Uh, and we spring them around. Yes. Opposite opposing motions. Opposing motions of the legs. And we did it laying down first. And then we did a little bit standing, hmm. um, progressing to standing. And I um, didn't do a lot of standing because he can't stand for very long without hmm. discomfort and weakness and fatigue. And I, he doesn't have that awareness yet so that I can say, tighten your abs, let's get out of back extension and move your leg. He doesn't have that awareness. So I couldn't really do that, say that for him. So um, we just did a little bit on in standing of leg kickbacks. Um, and then we did a hip flexor stretch. That was really challenging. It's super challenging to get someone like this to be able to do a hip flexor stretch because how do you actually do that? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I'll tell you what we tried. Um, I always like to try getting the hips elevated a little bit on the roller, on the wedge, um, or just have them come to the edge of the Cadillac and hang the leg off the edge mm -hmm. to get a hip flexor stretch. And I have them hug the other knee into the chest, just like hips on the roller kind of a thing, but off the edge, we couldn't do any of that. He mm -hmm. couldn't stabilize, not strong enough to stabilize any of that at all. So um, we ended up just going into uh, standing next to the reformer, hands on the foot bar, lunge position, but uh, trunk down lunge, lunge position, have him hold the lunge position and then try and stand up squeezing the glutes. So mm. he's getting the front of the hip opening. Mm -hmm. And if he felt any symptoms in the legs or back, 
we put him back down again and said, okay, let's try that with your legs again. So we let his torso go down to take this stress off. Mm -hmm. And then we try and have him come up with the torso. Um, it's so hard, even that's so hard for him to understand, but he knows at least in that standing position, he sees the relationship to the gate mm -hmm. and what he needs to be able to do while he's walking. So it's just sort of that retraining saying, okay, hold your tummy in, squeeze your glutes forward. Let's see if we can get your torso up more vertical with the leg behind you type of thing, small lunge, right? You don't wanna do a huge lunge and expect that that might happen on somebody like this, but just a really small lunge position and then working to get the torso upright using the glutes forward and hips mm. open. Yeah. The yeah. other thing we did was try doing coccyx curl and a little bit of a bridge roll up. Mm -hmm. That was to try and open up the front of the hips, but that also, right, if the legs are bent, what other structure are we ending up stretching? Not just so as anymore. What are we doing wrong? You're on the back with your legs, like a hook line? Um, yeah, so if you, if any time, so if we're trying to open the hip flexor and we then bend the knee, what other muscle goes on stretch as soon as we bend the knee? Oh, your quad. Yes, rectus femoris, right? Big one, yeah. Yeah, big one, big long one. So then we have to deal with rectus femoris. So in bridging, for example, if I have them bridging up oh. and rectus femoris is tight, mm -hmm. now I'm going to have that also to deal with. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So I had, um, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'll go on a little side, side explanation here on that, which I, I think is so cool. There was a scenario at one point in my studio, I had this huge aha moment. It, just because I ended up with two clients, both ladies in their 80s. One of them, they both came in with a bent over torso gait pattern, right? So they both came in walking a little flexed, right? And neither one of them had any hip extension happening in their gait pattern. One of them, I could put her on the just laying flat on her back and ask her to bridge up and she could do it, no problem. But if I straightened out her legs in the trapeze on the Cadillac and had her try and bridge up, she couldn't do it. The other one was exactly the opposite. If I tried to have her bend her, bend her knees and place her feet on the cattle, flat surface Cadillac to lift her hips into a bridge, she could not do it. But if I put her feet in the trapeze, she could. And it was so, shockingly clear to me what was going on there right so one of them the one that could bridge up with her knees bent had a tight psoas not a tight rectus femoris because if she and the other one had a tight rectus femoris but not so tight at her psoas so that she could bridge up if her legs were straight oh huh it was so clear and so interesting to have them both happen to be clients at the same time. Looks very similar the way they walked, but if you took it apart, it was two very different things. So if I was quad stretching both of them, only one of them, the one with the tight quad would really get better. I mean, probably get a, she'd get a little bit better, but I have a limited amount of getting better. The other one, if I was trying to stretch psoas on both of them, doing the same thing, stretching both their psoas, only one of them would get better. Not the one that had the tight psoas, not the one that had the tight rectus femoris so much, huh. right? So it's really cool and interesting to try and decipher which is the tighter muscle and then to stretch that appropriately. Wow. So is it psoas that's tight or is it rectus femoris that's tight? Because both of them cross the hip. Both of them essentially, I mean, psoas doesn't come from the ASIS, but um, iliacus comes from the inside of the ilia right there. So if we're talking about iliopsoas, right, there's that. Um, but just sort of differentiating those and understanding the difference in the stretches. So how, the, I think you know this, the difference in stretching psoas versus stretching rectus. If you were gonna stretch psoas. Oh, if I was gonna, I would, um, well, I, I think the best one is over the roller when you have your, mm -hmm. over the roller. But yeah. then and what the position is that leg in when it, when you're stretching it, the leg that's being stretched? Is it bent or straight? Oh, it's straight. 
Right. And so if you want to stretch rectus, then then you have to bend the knee and get the knee involved. The knee. Yeah. Because that mm -hmm. one crosses the knee too. It crosses both. So to really get yes. rectus on stretch, both knee and hip have to, to get on stretch. And if you have tight both, which does happen, so as and rectus, and you only stretch it with the bent knee, which is what I see a lot because in Pilates, because we it's so much easier to do like an Eve's lunge or the scooter series with the back with the leg that's up bent than it is to actually get the client to straighten the knee and pick it up off of the carriage. Mm. Because when they do that, then they want to bend forward. So they never get psoas on stretch. A lot of times we're only getting rectus or primarily rectus on stretch and very little psoas. So just something to really watch for and pay attention to, um, I think. And it was just, I wish I could have videoed them both and had that. But I, because I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. But they're both here. <laughs> right now, they both look the same, like video them walking and then video the difference with their bridging and then go, let's let's look at this. <laughs> you know, so interesting how, um, and, and you think, I mean, the, the natural thought is if somebody can't bridge, they're weak. Mm -hmm. But if they can't bridge because of weakness, she wouldn't have been able to bridge with her knees bent or knees straight. Right. That would have had, should have had no effect on if she could bridge or not, if her glutes were weak and hamstrings yeah. lifting her up. So is they someone, just, could someone do the trapeze one with their back, like trying squeezing, lifting with their back, you know, extensors, would that work or would their I, seat drop? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you could, you could get some overextension of the back, but to really get up off you have to actually get the glutes on. And I usually actually, honestly, especially with people who have a little bit of that posterior tilt and I'm worried about stenosis, which with these both ladies was actually the case. They both had stenosis too. We were doing um, coccyx curl into a bridge roll up. Mm -hmm. I do that a lot when I want to avoid the person going into back extension mm -hmm. and using their only their back to get up into a bridge. Okay. So that way I can keep rib cage down and then just lift tail up first and roll the way up. And I would call it a low bridge actually, where I usually keep them in order to keep that a little bit of a flexion in the spine rather than having them extend because that extension again can really compress. Yeah. So. Do you think it's helpful to do, um, so with the, with your guy who's more lateral and then you know, the, the pelvis should do this kind of figure 80 motion, right? When you, when you walking, would it be helpful to do, I don't know what it's called. I think someone called it like a sitting walk where you, you just sit and you basically walk on your sits bones to try and find that motion again, or would that exacerbate whatever he's happening down there? Do you know what um, I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. When you mention it, yes. Um, I honestly have never tried that with a client who needs to get back to a walking pattern. So I don't know um, <laughs> okay. if it would help. <laughs> it, it sounds like it would. What I ended up doing with him was, so the, the question, let's go to five and then I'll tell you what I mm. was trying to do with him or what I did, ended up doing with him. But so what do we want to achieve while working with him, this client, or what do we think we can achieve with uh, this client? Well, we want to achieve his endurance and walking. Right, right. And maybe restore, right? Restore yeah. the, oops, restore his uh, a sagittal gait pattern, right? Mm -hmm. Um, what's the problem with not correcting? So say we just wanted to go the route of strengthening. We didn't want to worry about, about what his gait pattern looked like and thinking maybe if we strengthen him, it'll just get better naturally. What's the problem with that? Well, we don't want to encourage a bad a misalignment that's just going to possibly cause more problems down the line. More problems, yeah. Yeah, so we're trying to avoid further issues. Yeah. Um, okay. And then, so then what I, do you think we can do this? Do you think we could restore a sagittal gait pattern or a better gait pattern for this person? 
Um, I think it depends on what <laughs> what really is happening in, in his back. Mm -hmm. So if 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 he doesn't really understand that or he won't, if there's pain or something that he's really not acknowledging or um, I don't know, acknowledging, I guess, then it might not ever work because something is actually hurting and he mm -hmm. can't get there. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's just because he, he sat in his weird couch for two years and just needs some realignment, then maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I always go about it this way. What are the things that could keep the spine happier? If, if we're worried about the spine or we're worried about some weakness coming from somewhere other than the legs, um, we'd be worried about the spine. What can we do to stabilize the spine? What is Pilates fantastic for? <laughs> the little muscles. The little muscles in the? What core, in the... right? <laughs> right in the core. Yeah. So if we stabilize his back, by giving him doing just what Pilates does, right? Strengthening abs, strengthening core, that should help him be able to sustain a better spinal position in general. So if we work to strengthen his abs and we work to stretch his hips, whether it's psoas or rectus, we determine which one or both and we work on stretching those open, give him a lot more strength in his center, then maybe we can actually restore a sagittal gait pattern without him having to move into lumbar extension to do it. Right. So I think, I mean, I think it's definitely worth a try. And then if we're restoring good function and good positioning and he's having more pain, then maybe we could have him go see a doctor. And mm -hmm. now we have something for the doctor to look at. Right. Or we have an explanation for maybe why he feels weak. So we could say to him, we've been working for four or five months. Your legs are definitely getting stronger you can feel it, right? I can feel it, you can feel it, we can see it here and the amount of exercise you're able to do when you're laying down or whatever. But as soon as we get you up standing and try and getting you walking, you're still having this weakness. So maybe if that's the case, maybe it's time to talk to somebody else about this and what could possibly be going on here. Because I don't think it's just muscular weakness in your legs anymore, right? Mm. So I think, you know, I, I was actually just looking, there's a PMA is putting out a talk somebody's giving on, um, it's a physical therapist who's a Pilates instructor doing a talk on objective measures of progress in Pilates and uh, some objective measures that you could use. One really good objective measure is to look at, so right now, even his subjective description of I can walk, I can walk 10 minutes only, see if you can, you write that down. I write it down every client. I'm writing notes on every client that comes in and what they say um, each time they come in. So I'm going to look for him to say, hey, I was able to walk for 15 minutes and it wasn't that bad. You know, it wasn't any worse. So um, I'm looking to see that that time is stretching because that's his primary goal. I always focus on what is their primary goal and how do I help them reach that primary goal? So if he comes in and says, I'm able to walk a little further, I'm going to be really excited about that. And I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, which is all the, all the things that we've come up with, all the things that we're doing and watch his progress go and just kind of keep track. So one way to do that is how far could you walk? Can you walk any further now? Are you feeling any stronger? Can you balance on one leg? Can you do that for longer than before? You know, those are great things to kind of keep track of. So, you know, you're making progress. If you realize that you're not making progress towards his goal, then after, you know, it takes eight weeks for muscle strength to grow. So you're not gonna really know if there's good progress for eight weeks. So two months of good hard work, but then you should see progress. And if there's not any progress toward these goals, that's a great time to refer them out to somebody else who can actually get them a diagnosis or Okay. See if there's a see if there's a diagnosis or something else that needs to be looked at, right? So, I think you know keeping track in with the person we talked about last week to watch her for you know do do everything you can for her for eight weeks and if there's no progress, then maybe something else is going on that really needs to be looked into more deeply. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know I've had to tell people you know look I need you to go get more information. I need you to see a doctor. Maybe the doctor wants to do some other studies and x-ray or an MRI or something and check it out more. 
Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the doctor sends you right back here, but I'd just like to know that um, we're okay and we're clear and that we're not missing anything. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, sort of beyond my scope. And those are the people who come back and they become kind of lifetime people, lifetime clients, because they appreciate that you cared enough to mm. say, we're not, we're, I don't want you to waste your money here. Like we're not making enough progress. And I think it's time we figure out why would you be opposed to yeah. going to see your doctor, or, you know? Yeah. So do you think like, so, yeah. um, so like my lady, you know, she comes one day a week, like, is that enough to really make I mean, it should make some progress for sure. Mm -hmm. um, is it enough to make enough progress? Depends on what she's doing the other six days of the week. Yeah. So we give all of our clients a home program, all of them, unless they want, or we tell them to come to the group classes, right? Either you need to come to three or four, you need to be in here three, four or five times a week with the group classes and privates, or you, we, you get to do your 15 minute home program every day. Like it really only has to be 15 to 20 minutes, but it's an, every, it should be every day. Okay. Those yeah. are the people. So if she's willing to do stuff on her own, and if she's still working towards your same goals, working to do the things that she should be doing on her own, mm -hmm. then she should make progress. If she's coming in once a week, if she's just coming in once a week and not doing anything else towards the goals, it's not nowhere near enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. She's so, doing her homework. So. She's good. Yeah. So, so then it should be, yeah, it should be all right. Awesome. Well, thank you for being in with me. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is great. so helpful. Oh my gosh. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I'm so glad. Yeah. Thank you for being my tried and true. I don't know where everybody is these days, but uh, who knows? <laughs>